Bienvenue Welcome to our virtual dialogue with Pascal Obodo and Asunda Mugiranisa following the uh, video performance Decolonize Architecture now made by Pascal Obolo, which you've just seen now. Pascal Obolo, you were born in uh, Yaoundé, come on, you are uh, a curator, founder, editor of the art magazine Africa Da. You are also the director of the African Art Book Fair, an independent publishing fair that uh, focuses on practical editing skills and unique publications. You have studied in the uh, Conservatoire Libre du Cinéma Français and you have a degree from University uh, of Paris 8 in the Department of Experimental Films. The feminist filmmaker Pascal Obolo is bringing her own perspective on the portrayal to the portrayal of women in art. Um, her films won many prizes at many festivals. She is an activist. So she has stories about memories, is dedicated to the themes of identity, exile, and visibility. Pascal Obolo is uh, driven by passion for the visual arts to produce and stage film objects because she refuses to be pigeonholed into a film genre. In 2013, her film Calypso Rose, Lioness of the Jungle, won the Silver Yeniga Prize at the Festival. Paco Festival in the documentary section. In her latest work, she scrutinizes archives through the construction of historical narratives from a post-colonial perspective, through visual and cultural representations of political and economic history, using photography, video and performance. In her stories, she looks at memories and their effect on today's societies. We are happy, Pascal, to uh, be able to talk with you about these topics on the basis of your performance video, Decolonize Bismarck's Fountain, Living Archive Part 1, which is the most recent piece in your project, Decolonize Architecture Now. Thank you again for joining us, Pascal. I am equal happy to uh, introduce Asunta Mugiraneza, who is with us today in order to react to Pascal Obolo's work. Um, Asunta Mugiraneza is a psychologist and sociologist by training. She's a Franco-Rwandan intellectual. She is the co-founder and director of IRIBA, a center for multimedia heritage in Kigali, the capital of Rwanda. She manages this archive center in order to create and offer space for talking freely and to dialogue, as well as accompany the process of reappropriation of the past. This Iriba Center is accessible to anyone for free, and it is at the crossroads between academia and field practice. Um, it's uh, put together and accompanies psychosocial, pedagogical, and artistic programs in order to weave and strengthen intergenerational ties and allow young people people to speak freely. So uh, thank you so much, Pascal and Asuna, to be here. I am happy to be talking to you today. My name is Katarina Hai. I am presently director of the Goethe Institute in Kigali, Rwanda, and I'm your host today. Pascal, in order to kick off our conversation, having watched the uh, video performance, which everyone could see now, would you please explain to us uh, and to the audience the context in which your film Decolonize Mark's Fountain finds its place? Um, thank you, Katarina Hay, for giving me the floor. I am delighted uh, uh, that I was able to show you this film. This is a film that belongs to a uh, pluridisciplinary project uh, entitled Decolonize Architecture Now. Uh, here, what's interesting is that it is uh, a sequence uh, that belongs to a filmic project which I am making just now. It is about handcrafting and rewriting filmic objects. Um, at the same time, I was interested in finding out how to produce a filmic object where each film sequence would be seen independently. So each uh, sequence may be seen 
and it is based on the uh, stories of performance. So these items, uh, these sequences can exist without having to uh, see the whole of the filmic object. Um, now, this particular piece is the centerpiece of my project. It's very important. This is why I selected it uh, to share it with you, with the audience of this festival. Indeed, it represents uh, and it starts with the Bismarck Monument. And from this uh, monument, I have worked out all of the backdrop to the film. I'd like to briefly summarize the idea behind the film project in order to later on zoom in on the particular sequence you have just seen in the video. In the beginning, I wanted to work with living archives not dead archives. So what are living archives? It's architecture, for instance, which you can find in the town of Buea, where I did my research. I worked here. This is also the place where you find the Bismarck Castle, the palace built in 1900 under the German colonial rule in Cameroon. I decided to start from the living archives which I could find here in the city of Buya and seek less the archives in Europe because indeed um, uh, at the beginning I was looking at archives produced by the Germans but then I soon realized that uh, these were uh, often propaganda material and that would have meant uh, that I would have needed to work at the possibility of decolonizing that material how to deconstruct this propaganda rhetoric in the German film archives to later re-own it within my filmic objects. So I decided to use what I could find in Buea, seeking and questioning the traces of the past still present in the town of Buea. Of course, you have the buildings, you have uh, certain street names, cemeteries, uh, German cemeteries, monuments, and this uh, castle. Um, and the interesting point here is that starting uh, with General Puttkammer, the German general who, who was the governor and owner of this uh, castle, and he was also the owner of all of the country of Cameroon. And so everyone who lives in that castle up until now, it is in fact the uh, second home residence of the uh, president of the country, President Bia. So, Anyone who lived in that building, in fact, uh, uh, ruled over the country, Cameroon. So this architecture, which embodies uh, this empirical colonial power, is represented by this palace. And I wanted to work on this. Um, I was thinking how to approach this, how to work at it. How? However, um, it turned out to be quite difficult because this this castle cannot be photographed. It is prohibited to, to film it. So how can you artistically occupy it? So I uh, started with the fictional tale. The story goes like this. Three ghosts that haunt the palace because they are unhappy about the way the colonial history is being told and uh, they try to tell their own uh, story but they do not succeed uh, so they decide to decolonize the uh, public spaces around that castle that palace in order to claim ownership of these spaces which were confiscated taken away from them um, and also, uh, it's about uh, decolonizing and healing the bodies. Um, so in uh, brief, uh, this project is about uh, issues pertaining to toxic 
bodies, colonial body that has to be decolonized, about public spaces that have to be recolonized. By this, I mean that when you reflect about the period in history of the German colonial rule in Cameroon, you must also realize that some people must also have put up some opposition or resisted to that German rule. People who have fought for independence of the country. Why are these protagonists not seen in public spaces? Why no monuments? Why no street names? Why, uh, the, places bearing the names of these fighters, of these uh, protagonists, uh, not even in cemeteries. Um, why are they made invisible? For me, it was an act of erasing, a form of erasing uh, of a strand of history, colonial history in this particular point. So how to reown that story by offering counter narratives, uh, starting with this piece, um, using fragments of uh, family stories, uh, Cameroonian family stories who lived through these times or somehow who are related to that legacy. Personally, I am related to that German, German colonial legacy because I have a grandmother who spoke German and she lived uh, in those times uh, of colonial German colonial rule. However, she never passed on all of this uh, to her children children and grandchildren. And so I used a family anecdote. Uh, I used my grandmother who spoke uh, German but never uh, spoke spoke about the story. Uh, I used her, that language in order to uh, put the pieces together, put the fragments of tales together stemming from citizens of Camus. Thank you very much, Pascal. It's, pa it's really fascinating, lots of details. And I would like to turn to Asunta uh, and ask her if she wants to react. Uh, ask you first, how did you interpret the video performance and how do you react to what Pascal has just said now. And Pascal, you mentioned many topics already that are of great interest to us, and we shall come back to them, of course, uh, later in the conversation. Asunta. I am deeply moved by the description given by Pascal of her own work, um, because although it is the first time that our paths cross, the majority of the ideas and the outlook Pascal formulates resonates uh, very much in me and also in Rwanda, where I am. This video is fantastic. It's uh, obliges people um, uh, to stop in front of a place. It it's really makes them stop. All, I think we all have this experience that every day we uh, walk past the same places, we never stop, never think about them, never question them, as if everything had been told. But this body, which is beautiful, it keeps its beauty, it keeps its dignity, and this body expresses itself without any violence. However, it reclaims a space which normally is not his, and he reowns it, not in a way that would destroy or would somehow dirty it, but in a manner which uh, enhances, uh, in a sense, his own approach in his own work. Saying, look at me, as black as I am, me, a Negro, me, Cameroonians, uh, Cameroonian, I can occupy this space. And I feel that his way uh, of doing so is very legitimate. The way he speaks and the words uttered are quite impressive, as impressive uh, as the movements. It's a way of saying, 
stop here, look. Let us try to think about uh, its exact meaning of this monument. Now, Pascal sets this piece inside a wider project, which makes me want to see all of the parts of the project, of course. But I must say, I think it is crucially important to have those self-sufficient excerpts as standalones because they can be more easily and readily used. One talks often about decolonizing the colonial legacy, reowning the past, but very often those are nothing but words. What is missing is something that allows us to do so while overcoming the language barriers and borders. Uh, Therefore, I want to really applaud Pascal for her work and tell her, please, please continue on this path, particularly as you are lucky to have found a form of expression which is not using language. What you just made, anyone can watch and understand. I really envy you for having found this uh, form of expression. And this is the essence of the work of performance artists. They find ways to go beyond linguistic barriers. Um, a language often is also in itself a legacy of the colonial past. So to give a brief comment is difficult, so I'll just say chapeau, congratulations. Thanks to you, Asunta. Pascal, I would like to pick up the uh, track and the topic of the body, the body that's hurt, traumatized in the uh, uh, colonial, in the colonized body and the way you cast an artistic light on it. You confront us with a, a, a statue that glorifies colonization in a way. So how can we understand your endeavor, your process towards decolonization as the audience? Because you use a statue glorifying colonization in order to decolonize. Pascal. I apologize, I'm thinking. In fact, this is a question which uh, links back to the notion of sick bodies, invisible wounds deep inside the bodies, not only of the colonized, but also the body of the colonizers. So starting point here is the sick body, but these bodies do not suffer from the same ailment and do not present the same wounds. What I also find very important is how, starting with artistic or through artistic practices, we are able to question history and at the same time heal such bodies. By way of example, what is the uh, interaction in our everyday life when you are in uh, a public space? How do our bodies consciously or unconsciously interact with the buildings, the architecture, uh, which we find in these public spaces. So to investigate physical stories through performing art is also a topic that I find fascinating because the choreographer André Takoussa, with whom I worked here, in uh, his work, he often resorts to traditional ritual practices of our forefathers. So here it's also about how to improve our memories, use our memories of immanent age-old practices to invoke the spirits. Um, so we decided to work together. Just as these bodies have a story, the buildings 
too have mm -hmm. their own story to tell. So this is a statement which uh, makes even more sense when you deal with colonial architecture. So what are the challenges of the body for the making of the individual? So these uh, issues, to my mind, are fundamental today, at least um, in the issues studied by and in the processes involved in making a work of art today. Day. So, uh, what are the challenges of a body deconstructed by a work of art? And uh, this is a bit like uh, the colonial body, as discussed by Franz uh, Simon. Uh, uh, in this film, uh, it, we also talk about the memory of the body. It seems important uh, to bring forth the past, um, but also talk about the present, healing, and talk about the future. So uh, once healed, these bodies, how can they continue to interact in public spaces? And so using the tool of performance uh, through the choreographer André Takusa, whom you've seen, we decided to uh, work at the idea of putting forward ephemeral monuments who invoke, convoke the spirits of forgotten events of the past, uh, uh, invite uh, the spirits uh, of uh, past heroes in these public spaces um, and in that sense i talk about it as recolonizing body and mind um, so of course it is difficult to um, make yourself understood by the institutions but symbolically it is important to have public monuments which uh, bear the names of those forgotten heroes. They, and somewhere, uh, we must recolonize these spaces uh, which have been taken away from us. The absence of such public spaces uh, uh, who are now polluted by the traces of the colonizers, this absence of monuments invite us, invite these spirits to propose even ephemeral monuments, um, even uh, very short-lived uh, films, videos like this one, even just for the duration of a performance. Um, and this to encourage the institutions, the authorities to build them in real life for the well-being of their citizens. And I believe it's Valentin Modi Bewa who was talking about recolonizing um, in the sense of retaking what was taken away from us in the colonial times. Um, so this film talks about uh, reappropriation of public space and about uh, this manner of recolonizing, reowning what was uh, taken away from us for so long. Thank you, Pascal. This um, uh, really uh, makes me uh, think of the uh, initiatives, uh, civil society initiatives in Germany uh, to uh, work at post-colonial memories, working at local memories, renaming streets, renaming squares. Uh, so to really uh, allow local history to find roots in public spaces, uh, also a way of healing um, sick bodies. As you said, there are different kinds of sick bodies and it's necessary that all of them work at uh, revisiting these memories. So this exchange between uh, the body and the colonial uh, 
architecture is something Asunta, I'm sure you uh, uh, are burning to see what you think of it. And I know that Pascal herself wants to hear how you work uh, on the topic of colonial past in uh, relation to your colonial architecture in Kigali. Um, would you like, please, to share with us your take on this? Thank you very much. What Pascal is sharing with us would require much more time to zoom in on each point. But first of all, let me remind you of some fundamental differences between Rwanda and Cameroon. Uh, first of all, the German colonial rule lasted only 16 years, so not at all what happened in Cameroon. And it is true that when I traveled to Cameroon, each time that I wanted to discover a new town, I always found traces of the past, of that past, buildings, monuments, uh, which uh, uh, conspicuously did not originate from Cameroon. But in Rwanda, as I said, the German colonial period lasted only 16 years. Um, this being said, it changed uh, uh, the way um, Rwandas saw themselves because um, at best uh, he was made to understand that he is or she is nothing or at worst something bad, barbarian and backward. Another aspect is uh, relevant for Rwanda, but maybe also in other countries. There was a passing of the baton between colonial powers at the end of the First World War. So it, there was a German colonization, but it then stopped, it ended, and it went into a different, it went to a different colonial power. This meant that nothing changed because for the local people it made absolutely no difference the colonial rule continued on and on and the local indigenous people as they were called um, uh, just uh, made no difference between the Belgian French or German powers uh, it was the same story that went on so uh, yes Rwanda is uh, independent uh, but you cannot talk about this um, you must talk about the genocide you must uh, of course you want to talk about the traces of the past you have uh, some buildings but they're less impulsive or impressive than in Cameroon. Rwanda had a different history. And somehow we don't have so many um, hard traces in our architecture. On the other hand, the Rwandan spirit, his identity, his self-perception, the perception of his country, of his landscape, of the place where he lives, is something which was completely uh, um, uh, transformed by this very sad colonial period. Today, when you want to think about the traces of, pa of the past, and when you want to um, operate a re-owning of that very uh, hurtful past, um, you must come to terms with what has changed. The, and it is not necessarily visible. The Rwandan is a being who uh, shares a culture of body self-control. It is very hard to spot the suffering in the body um, because Rwandans do not uh, produce uh, many contemporary performance. They are more into uh, seeking things as they existed before. And once these things are found, of course, they are mixed with the present day things. And this leads to very beautiful contemporary creations, contemporary expressions. However, but if you 
study the actual perception of one's identity and that goes beyond its physicality you realize all the insults that were swallowed up embedded internalized in the body as they belong to this being who is inferior barbarian ignorant pagan never baptized who does not go to school never learned to write who is unable to do things as we do it or them and uh, it is always uh, um, judge uh, using the standard of the colonial we the golden standard to judge everything we immediately realize the extent of amputation of the self-identity that stems from this relation to colonization in africa and here i'm going to talk about something uh, in a politically incorrect terms um, we had a number of pseudo independence from colonial powers i'm not they were not fully implemented these independencies i'm not saying that i regret this um, I, I do not regret that independence happened not at all but i do regret the way it happened independence was often a mere change of occupant of the seat of power uh, and the change of incumbent ruler, uh, well, there wasn't a huge big difference. Pascal mentioned it earlier. Why is it that this palace in Bouya uh, is used only by the president of the country? Why is it not returned to the people? Uh, here in Rwanda, um, the reactions to this state of affairs uh, tend to be the opposite and sometimes uh, in an excessive fashion. Uh, after the genocide, people viewed the past, um, colonial past and other previous forms of government of the country were all seen as a past to get rid of. At times, destruction was mixed up with deconstruction. Um, people mix these two things, and I believe it is necessary to deconstruct colonial ideologies, study what that means in our daily life, try to find in our way of dressing, moving, doing things things these traces but not to say we must erase everything but to say i know where this comes from where it originates i accept it and i draw a space uh, uh, for myself um, so the trend in Rwanda is to erase the past entirely as being bad and I take the view that archives, even if colonized, are better than no archives at all. This being said, we must work uh, uh, to uh, and, and study the archival material closely under all angles to re-own it, uh, question it, expurge it from its deadly ideology, uh, uh, which colonized is for both sides of colonization. So it is uh, not a work that can be done uh, only in the former colonized countries. It should involve everyone. This process is facilitated today by the opportunities uh, offered by the digital revolution. A few years back, we would have been forced to stop talking about it and forget today the multimedia uh, uh, allow us to dream aloud the filmic performance we watched just now is an invitation for all of us to dream in Rwanda and elsewhere yet we must beware not to give way to a smooth globalized movement uh, because each country each people each area presents its own attributes peculiarities with and all of this makes us richer and stronger we do not need a uniform colonized whole history or narratives we need to be able to express ourselves in our differences which render us more attractive thank you asunta would you like to react uh, directly to what asunta said pascal well not really because she said everything and summarized everything so uh, well 
the wish to reinvent oneself, to redefine oneself, uh, otherwise to tell one's uh, story differently came out very well in what she just said. I think she uh, uh, explained my point uh, very well. I was much struck by the ability of individuals who, despite everything they have gone through, are still able to reinvent and redefine themselves in order to be oneself without overcoming the past, without illuminating the past and erasing it, in order to walk towards the future. I would like us to come back to the heroes, heroes of decolonization that you name in your work. Uh, even if it's ephemeral uh, statues, I am curious, in your artistic and intellectual work, where do you uh, place women? What is the position of women? And this is a topic which is always of interest. Where are they, these women? Where is the visible uh, women? Um, or is, is it that gender? That gender is made even more invisible? Please share with us your ideas about the role of women in all of that history. Well, here, it, the issue of invisibility is linked to the issue of bodies, bodies uh, that are visible, mid-invisible. Um, this is of high interest to me. So how does it operate, this erasure of uh, uh, the stories of uh, these bodies made invisible? It, just like the female body, the female body is a body often forgotten, made invisible, even when it, she is an important activist in the history of the country, there is a trend to reduce or even erase completely the role of women in the making of history. So the erasure of stories is uh, something which is of high interest to me. How does the uh, construction of a country's story unfolds? while erasing the stories of women, women, the female heroes who also fought in those times. These women exist, but we seldom see them, we seldom hear them, we seldom read them. Uh, I would say that they're almost inexistent. So there are various ways of writing and erasing stories, and this is an issue that I've decided to work on. So you have very straight out of erasing in the construction of a story, in the telling of a history, um, forgetting women, uh, women who uh, took part in the uh, construction of the country. Um, usually they're the very last wheel of the cart in the history produced, told, sometimes questions by historians. Indeed, I believe that history is written by men. So, just like uh, history is a hegemonic uh, thing, it's the winner 
who tells the story of the colonies, not the losers. This is why when you look at the way the colonial era is taught at school and uh, in many artworks and cultural works and textbooks, it is somewhere biased because it is grounded on the story told by the winners. And so they reduced the role of the uh, losers. And in the story told by the losers, which are appearing nowadays, um, you have the uh, stories of the women, uh, uh, the tales of women are also being erased in the uh, stories of the losers. They are forgotten. So I would like to insist on the concept, the concept of counter narratives. What is that about? Counter narratives are about deficiencies, shortcomings, absences, voids uh, in history. Um, for instance, we are missing uh, these women. We don't have the stories uh, pertaining to these women made invisible, and we need to rewrite them make them visible again, contribute to a global narrative where everyone can recognize him or herself, everyone can reclaim uh, his space uh, in relation to the role played in that story. Um, so, so deconstruction of a narrative where you have uh, two different levels in the population, men on the one hand, who are very present, and uh, a narrative where the female portion is absent. Oh, I think this is uh, thought provoking, uh, and we must hear what uh, Rwanda uh, does um, in terms of uh, of, of women, and we know that Rwanda is the country for women empowerment. There's many articles and works, biographies of women being published. So, um, so this uh, uh, seems to contradict a little bit what you're describing, Pascal. Asunta, what do you say? Well, here, like everywhere else, it is difficult to talk about women without going into specifics. But I shall uh, uh, use one of the concepts already used so far. We're talking about decolonization, so let's just take that aspect. The status of women took a big leap backward uh, during the colonial era because in the past, in Rwanda, women had their own space in society. They were not downgraded to the role of housekeeper or maid. She was central to society. She was central to traditional religions. She occupied various religious roles. Rwandan women existed. It is with the colonial rule that woman was given a much smaller space at the service of man and even much inferior to the indigenous man. The indigenous man was much more worth than the indigenous woman. I believe that uh, this was an intention uh, that you can find in the colonial ideology. Maybe that happened after the German colonial rule. Maybe it was under the Belgium colonial power because they aimed at destroying uh, the traditional structures by separating the king from the queen 
mother. The, although the king could not rule without her, so uh, the colonial authorities uh, deemed it vital to separate them and to install a king on the throne who accepted to have a queen with a diminished rule. It would take far too long to explain the details, but unfortunately today we find the traces of past Rwandan women uh, who are heroes. Sometimes, I must admit, uh, they are uh, presented in a much too embellished form to be sincere. Uh, well, the very first person in Rwanda to have thought up the constitutional code was a woman. And in fact, she was a poet as well. So it brings together art, politics and history. And I am so overjoyed when young graduates decide uh, to work further uh, on such um, female figures. I'm working presently with someone who is a, a graduate, so he's able to do his research in the archives, to formulate questions, to challenge the material and also able to write. But there's a lot of creation, there's a lot of, uh, uh, whether it's through uh, dance or singing, or not only writing, all of this to rehabilitate the past while standing on one's two feet in the present using contemporary means. So this process of decolonization cannot succeed if the injustices are not repaired, especially the unfair treatment of women. And this is why I'm so pleased that we are meeting today as women on this platform. But these issues, if you want them to be heard higher up, you know, I have nothing against men, but the fact is that you always need a guy to stand behind you to get the recognition of all the things achieved by women. So all of that comes from very far. It comes through the colonial mold and everything what followed afterwards. And so now it's up to us to stand up and say, okay you can follow us but it is not up to you to tell us so to rehabilitate these figures is important in Cameroon too you had many female figures uh, great women but they were forgotten so we need uh, uh, to facilitate the emergence of new narratives however this is impossible without collaboration between uh, uh, the uh, representatives of former colonized countries uh, together with the representatives of former colonial powers and Pascal and all the others are not answerable for the crime of colonization for what happened in the past. But we carry this history with us. On the other hand, this story of colonization is not being told to the young people in schools in Europe today. They are exposed to populist and racist narratives which generate, which already generated in the past horrific crimes in Europe. The immigrants of yesterday, today renamed migrants, actually that is another thing that's worth studying. Uh, the young ones are not able to draw the link between that phenomenon today about the refugees and the uh, migrants and the past. I believe we would require much more investment in uh, decolonization uh, for those who live in the more comfortable region of the world, which is Europe, rather than in Africa because in Africa we are obliged to look at it every day, whereas in Europe you can draw the curtain and leave. I think you need to open that curtain. We are the heirs of this common disaster.
Thank you so much for sharing this, uh, uh, these thoughts with that. But uh, of course, I do not want to uh, finish without uh, going back to civil society, which you mentioned, um, because of course, uh, we are very much keen on uh, understanding the role of civil society. So please uh, tell us more about this fight, this work that we have to do together, the work on memories on in the northern and southern hemisphere. Um, the, starting with German experience, it's not partition, but civil society, militants, uh, university uh, people who uh, pushed the partitions in order to do this work on post-colonial memories. So please tell us more about the impact of civil society in this work uh, on post-colonial memories. Now, the concept of civil society is also something that would merit a precise definition. Uh, well, because it's not only civil society and uh, is linked to human rights. Civil society it is not uh, the enemy of government. Um, so, um, so how do you define it? We need a common definition. It's not the enemy of government. It's it acts freely. It represents a stream of actors uh, that act uh, in the respect of the laws of the country, and who are. Uh, citizens, we are citizens since we are civil society representatives. Um, now, in issues such as memory, such as rehabilitation, in the uh, question of studying history, I think it's imperative that civil society should be active. Um, of course, state institutions can draw the framework, but it won't unearth the stinking piece of past events which uh, their predecessors have buried. I'm so sorry, we have no time now uh, to delve into this, but I cannot be silent on these aspects of government because our governments are often the heirs of such violent policies. They often and sat down on chairs left by the colonial rulers of yesterday. Therefore, this work requires a distance which civil society can provide when. So I'm putting everyone in the same bag, intellectuals, artists, so human rights and environmental activists and so on, who take part in the life of the city but we do not take part in this as if we were making a living out of it. No, we are not making a living. We are not employees of the state. We, uh, uh, the, uh, civil servants uh, are getting a salary to do that work. Uh, we are free. Maybe we lack means. However, what we do, we do it uh, so that our city, in the ancient Greek sense of the term, should live on and progress. And so when I work, I always say that I am uh, a citizen. I have the duty in Rwanda to do that work. And you, uh, the institutions, have the duty to correct me if I'm wrong and to take over because the city is central to the work of decolonization. And I shall stop here. Thank you very much, Katarina and Pascal. Well, it is true that I always thought that the great 
transformations and fights were always born within civil society. Thanks to demonstrations, revolutions, uh, thanks to the commitment of citizens, uh, the people in civil society, that we uh, could transform our societies and also see them evolve and develop. This is what I call, so the actors in the uh, fringes, in fact, are the true center. This is another topic which we did not have time to talk about. The center, what is it? Who holds power? Who holds power to tell the story? Which version of the uh, story, the hegemonic version of the winners? And this is about uh, uh, the other idea of uh, moving away from the center moving away from the center to the periphery and here we're coming to uh, 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 the fields you're talking about the activists normal people who are taking risks who are fighting hard to change our societies for tomorrow and the future of tomorrow is based on the possibility to produce common goods how to do so in a society where the issue of erasure uh, of the past or the question of power relations uh, colonial power or uh, patriarchal uh, power relations is very much uh, present. So um, this work is uh, very often uh, the work of civil society and the role of civil society is taking up more space because they are also the ones who are uh, feeling the consequences of this system. But uh, it is in civil society that you find hope and energy to change the world um, for tomorrow, to continue thinking how can we produce uh, more commons in order to improve our life together. Thank you very much, Pascal. Thank you very much for playing your part uh, in this work of construction as an artist uh, and uh, working uh, on the decolonization of memories of colonial times. Thank you, Asunta. Thank you, Pascal, for this very uh, and vivid discussion, and I should hope it is only the beginning of a long exchange on these uh, topics and uh, please please continue to uh, share with us the fruit of your exchanges thank you asunta and pascal obolo for this dialogue thank you for listening dear listeners um, uh, to uh, this is the last day of our festival latitude on rethinking power relations for uh, a decolonized and non-racial world thank you very much and have a good day everyone thank you Merci beaucoup.